Hi, y'all. Welcome, everybody. We will be starting in two minutes. And um, Deborah, before uh, folks hop on, remember to mute yourself when you can. I think oh, I can hear you. Hey everybody, let's give everybody another minute or so to uh, get in and then we will start. Alrighty, everybody, for time's sake and uh, to respect everybody's time, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, everybody. It is great to see y'all. Um, welcome to Period Products 101 series. Uh, right now, I'm actually going to turn it over to our amazing interpretation team to give some instructions. Awesome. Thank you so much. I will share the instructions in Spanish first and then in English. Hola, muy buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Itzel y estoy aquí de parte de la cooperativa de Community Language para proveer servicios de interpretación simultánea. Estoy aquí porque los organizadores de este evento se han comprometido con la justicia del lenguaje y queremos asegurarnos de que cada persona en esta reunión pueda escuchar y ser escuchado en el idioma de su corazón. En unos minutos vamos a aprender uh, la interpretación simultánea. Uh, cuando la aprendamos van a poder ver un icono de un mundo en la parte inferior de su pantalla. Cuando le hagan clic a este icono van a tener la opción entre el canal de español o el canal de inglés. Este es el idioma en el que les gustaría escuchar y participar durante la reunión. Y es importante que cada persona elija un canal para que cuando yo cambie de un idioma a otro usted pueda seguir escuchando en el idioma que eligió originalmente. Les pido a todos que hablen a un paso conversacional y que solo hablen una persona a la vez. Y también si tienen algún una pregunta en cualquier momento déjenos saber en el chat o con su micrófono y estamos felices de ayudarles. Gracias. Hello everyone, my name is Itzel and I'm here on behalf of the Community Language Co-op to provide simultaneous interpretation services. I'm here because the organizers of this event have made a commitment to language justice and we want to ensure that every person in this meeting is able to, in this webinar, is able to listen and be heard in the language of their heart. In just a few moments we will turn on the interpretation feature. So you will see a globe icon at the bottom of your screen. 
Once you click on this icon, you will have the option of choosing either the English or the Spanish channel. This is the language in which you would like to listen and participate during the meeting, and it's important for everyone who is not fully bilingual to choose a language, just that whenever I switch from one channel to the other, you continue listening in the language that you originally chose. Um, and I just ask everyone to speak at a conversational pace just so that I'm able to uh, transmit the best version of your message. And just one person, uh, please speak at a time. And if at any moment you have any questions, please let us know in the chat or with your mic and we'll be happy to help you. And we will also post the written uh, instructions on the chat in case you need to review everything. But yeah, we should be uh, good to go. Awesome, thank you so much for that. Uh, I am going to give, um, awesome, make sure you turn on your interpretation and pick a language. And I encourage y'all to uh, enter the chat and introduce yourselves uh, and tell us where you are. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, great. Well, thank you all. We'll get started. Um, it's really great to see I'm watching the attendees roll in. It's great to see a lot of folks here who have been part of LEAVE for a long time. And, um, and those of you who may be brand new uh, to our organization, welcome. Um, we are Women's Voices for the Earth. Um, we've been around for almost 30 years now. Um, and what we does is we drive action towards a future free from the impacts of toxic chemicals rooted in gender justice alongside those historically and presently ignored by the environmental health movement by leveraging an international or intersectional solidarity approach based on our expertise in research um, advocacy and organizing. And specifically, this means we work to eliminate toxic chemicals that affect our health that are found in household products, like the period products we're going to talk about today. Now, our staff doesn't um, and can't do this work alone. Uh, we need all of you involved in the movement uh, to make change really happen, um, both because your voices are both important and very powerful, um, but also because it's crucial to ensure that your perspectives and lived experiences inform and guide our work. Um, whether it's educational opportunities like today or using your voices to advocate on legislation or on a corporate campaign, um, it's very much a team effort and we really appreciate you all being here. Um, so to introduce myself, I'm Alexandra Scranton. I'm the Director of Science Research here at Weave. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Um, my role here is to keep us up to date on the latest science on chemicals in products, and I lead our research efforts and author our, um, our scientific reports. And I'm very excited to be presenting with my colleague, Trini. So I'll turn it over to you. Hey, y'all. How many of y'all can say uh, you get to work with a science and research person, which is super awesome? Uh, Mike, uh, Nunania, Trini, Birch, my pronouns are she, her. I would like to welcome y'all again today. Um, I am on the stolen and occupied land that we now call Denver, Colorado. I am a Southern Ute, Ute Mountain in Diné. Uh, I come from Southwest Colorado and where I grew up on the Southern Ute Indian Reservation. And I am, as a Native American woman, it is super important to drive this work uh, forward for a healthier and safer future for uh, all communities. So it is great to be here with y'all today. Next slide, please. Awesome. So we have um, decided, we decided to put on this product series for y'all. Um, and this is the first webinar in this series. Um, it is Period Products 101. Uh, our next product series is going to be Intimate Care Products 101, which is going to be on April 24th. So please sign up for that 90 minute webinar. We have a QR code so y'all can scan and sign up. And then in the future, we have um, Cleaning Products 101 and Salon Products 101. We are really excited to announce this series uh, moving forward. Uh, Weave has done some amazing work uh, so that we can provide this information to our community um, and that we can educate y'all about everything that we've learned. And it's really uh, great to uh, be able to do this for y'all. 
So if y'all could and want to go ahead and scan the QR code and sign up. Next, please. Awesome. It's also super important to acknowledge uh, the land that we are on and the land that we occupy um, at Weave, uh, at Women's Voices for the Earth. We also call it Weave, so you'll probably hear that a lot. Uh, we would like to formally recognize that the land we operate on was unjustly taken from indigenous tribal nations we refer to today as the Nichu, Ute, Shoshone, Apache, Cheyenne, and Arapaho, along with various other tribes who utilize this land in conjunction with each other. Um, I encourage you, um, and I actually forgot to tell y'all, our amazing behind the scenes team, uh, Deborah and Elizabeth, are working hard in the chat and, and moving the slides, so we'd like to acknowledge them. Um, they are part of the WEAV team, and you'll see Elizabeth putting some information in the chat for y'all um, as we go along. So please um, keep an eye on that and click uh, those things. We encourage you to look up um, who's native land that you currently occupy and keep that a running practice in the future. Next. Awesome. So I am here to ground y'all. I think that getting... Um, and doing this work and, and coming into spaces like this, it's super important to ground, uh, to be able to, you know, learn and focus and really just um, and move, for, move, move forward in this work in a really good way. Um, and so I would like to do uh, some breathing exercises with y'all and then um, a 333 three, three exercise with y'all. So I'm going to have y'all just um, find your bodies and find your breath. Uh, really just get cozy in that seat, put your legs on the, on the ground, maybe shake it out a little bit, <laughs> um, get ready for some amazing information to come your way, open up. Uh, in the first round, we're going to do uh, breathing. So we're going to do breathe in for five seconds, hold for five seconds, and breathe out for five seconds. Um, I'm going to count uh, through the first one, and then we can do the rest on our own. Uh, okay, let's take a deep breath in for five seconds. One, two, three, four, five. Hold. One, two, three, four, five. And breathe out. One, two, three, four, five. Awesome. Great. So now, we're going to do that on our own. So let's breathe in. Hold. And breathe out. Three more times. One more. Awesome, y'all. All right, so now let's uh, do identify three objects around you in your room, identify them, look around, uh, identify three sounds that you hear, and move three body parts. Awesome, now we're ready. Now we're ready to dive into this. Next, please. Awesome, of course we wanna start uh, with some course objectives and goals uh, in order to create a safe space. Uh, the objectives of this workshop are to create a welcoming, inclusive, accessible space for community to learn and engage in conversation around period products, their ingredients and chemicals they may contain. Our goals for this session would be to create an inclusive space free of judgment and shame, to learn, to ask questions and to offer opportunities to take action. Awesome. So let's start with an icebreaker uh, and, and let's put this um, our answers in the chat. So use one word or phrase to describe your relationship with your menstruation or what you know about menstruation. 
Uh, and I think here it's super important to, to recognize and acknowledge that not all women are menstruators. So use your chat, the chat feature and just plug it in there. Natural, awesome. <laughs> I think mine would be, oh man, harsh maybe. I don't think we <laughs> have that, that, I don't know. It feels like I've been going through it for a really long time and it hasn't gotten better. <laughs> Oh, these are great. Thank you, everybody, for putting in the chat. I love seeing all this. Yeah, kind of a, a, a mix of mix of negative and positive thoughts. I like to see both. That's great. Yeah, the sense of human and natural. Great perspective. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. These are great. All righty. Oh, I love it. <laughs> no life about them. Really good point. <laughs> All righty. So, um, so let's get into um, get into this. You can feel free to 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 keep chatting in if you if you come up with one. Um, a brief overview, what we're going to be talking about today are all kinds of period products and what we know about the ingredients they contain. Um, we're going to discuss some of the health implications of those ingredients and that exposure, as well as discussing some of the impacts of culture and stigma on menstruation. Um, and we want to be clear, as um, Trini was saying, um, that um, we aim to have our work be gender expansive, um, with the understanding that not all people who menstruate identify as women. Um, but we acknowledge that this is a work in progress, and certainly even for us, um, some of our older weave resources still contains language that, that needs to be updated. Um, so a little history on period products. Um, historically, there were various um, solutions. As far as we uh, sort of know, largely absorbent cloth um, or material was used either internally or, or externally to um, collect and, and, and manage menstrual fluid. Um, it really wasn't until the 1920s that the first menstrual pads and tampons were commercially produced. And these were actually um, inspired by products that were used for first aid on the battlefield. There were uh, war nurses like on the battlefield stopping bleeding of soldiers and realizing that the tools they had were actually pretty handy for menstruation as well. And the menstrual, modern menstrual sort of product industry kind of boomed from, from there. Um, a lot of people don't realize menstrual cups were actually patented um, first in the 1930s, um, but they didn't really take off in popularity until much more recently. But still, the most common um, and, and popularly used um, products today are disposable pads, liners, and tampons. It's the vast majority of the market. Um, but in recent years, the market has changed a lot, um, and I think for the better, making other forms of period products much more available so in addition to disposables, we have reusable products like menstrual cups and menstrual discs um, made of silicone. Um, there's reusable cloth pads and reusable period underwear also made of fabric. And for sure, there is new technology also um, in the works um, uh, that, because there are actually a, a number of women run particularly companies um, that are really rethinking what it, what it takes and, and what we can do to, to manage menstruation better. Um, and it's worth saying right up front that there is no perfect product that we're going to be introducing to you today. Um, everybody is different. Um, everybody has different needs. They have different flows. They have different situations. Um, we also want to acknowledge that accessibility to period of products can vary a great deal, um, whether that's due to the cost of products or just even availability in your neighborhood. Um, there will be no preaching today. There's no shaming of what anyone should or shouldn't be using. We are really just here to provide you all with more information um, to help you make the best decision for yourself. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Awesome, thank you, Alex. Um, I think in this space, it's uh, important to take a moment and recognize Indigenous people uh, and acknowledge their culture and traditions and a lot of, um, and to destigmatize around uh, menstruation, especially, you know, I think somebody uh, entered in the chat that it's a great time for cleansing and renewal. 
um, as a Native American woman, I think that's super important. And for me, you know, it's important to drive that work forward to destigmatize the work that we do. Um, and it's a brief reminder that menstruation is celebrated in many cultures and traditions, a time to gather community during this monumental time in an individual's life. Uh, there is, um, there's this amazing zine where we have a little clip on it right here, We Think and re indigenize Menstruation, that was done by one of our amazing fellows, Kiana Davis. I um, encourage you to check it out. There is a lot of great information in there. There is some uh, examples of uh, traditions that happen uh, in Native cultures and Indigenous cultures and what that looks like. So I encourage you to um, read, read on it. I believe Elizabeth put that in the chat for y'all to have access to. Um, it's just a really beautiful tribute to culture and traditions and uh, it, it's amazing. So thank y'all for that. Next. Okay, back to me. Um, I wanna talk a little bit of the history of ingredient disclosure for period products. I think most people don't realize that before about two and a half years ago, we really had very little information about what period products actually contained as far as their um, ingredients. Most companies did not disclose their ingredients. So going back in history, before 2014, ingredients were really very rarely disclosed um, on either packages or websites. We just didn't know a lot about what was in there other than some basics kind of cotton rayon um, uh, ingredients. Um, starting in 2014 to 2021, um, we had some limited voluntary disclosure of ingredients by some manufacturers. And this was due to great campaigns from Weave and, and many of, of you all who were involved in, in those voices asking companies uh, to provide more in, in information about their ingredients. So we started seeing, particularly on websites, some ingredient lists um, that were you know limited information being um, made available. Now in 2019, we got a law passed that we lobbied heavily for um, in New York State um, called A164. And it was the first law in the country that required companies, any company selling a period product in the state of New York had to have ingredients printed on the label. So it's the first time that was actually required by law. Um, the law didn't go in effect, into effect until November, 2021. So we went back and checked after November, 2021 and really found that most period products on the shelves now had ingredient lists for the first time just giving us so much more information about what was in these products um, than we knew before. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I just wanna give you an example of the kind of things um, we found. Now, before the law passed, I did a lot of research looking at labels, looking at websites, um, and for menstrual pads, you pretty much saw these nine ingredients um, or some combination or you know, some similar words to these. Um, this is what we knew menstrual, product, menstrual pads particularly were made of um, before the law um, passed. Um, and now we go to the next slide to see what happened after the law. After the law, when we went back, this is the list of ingredients that we found. It's about 80 different ingredients. No one product contained all 80 of these, um, but, but clearly there was a lot more to these um, products than we were being previously told by companies. Um, there was, uh, you know, relatively little disclosure, and now there's a lot. Now, we don't know a lot about a lot of these chemicals or even why they're in some of these products, um, and we certainly don't know a lot about the health effects of what some of these chemicals are, but it's clear that there's a lot more chemical exposure than we knew was happening before, um, and having that information and that ingredient disclosure is really the start to learning um, uh, how to get to, to safer products. Um, okay. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so this is a list of chemicals that you won't find on period product labels or on websites. Um, these are some of the toxic chemicals that have been detected through chemical testing. Now, Women's Voices for the Earth has done some of our own testing. Um, some governments outside the US have done some, some testing regimens. There have been some independent researchers, some other nonprofits have done chemical testing of period products looking for harmful chemicals. So these are the kinds of things they're finding. We're finding phthalates, which are linked to reproductive harm, dioxins and furans, formaldehyde, heptane, hexane, carbon disulfide, styrene, toluene, PFAS. These are all, it's, it's a scary list of chemicals. Um, they are um, quite, quite serious. They are being found in these products in relatively low levels. 
Um, and it's, it's none of these, as far as we know, are being added intentionally into any of these products, but they are there. Um, and the problem is we don't have um, any research available that tells us that the levels that we're seeing in these products and the kinds of exposures we're getting from period products, um, how that's affecting our health. We just, it just simply hasn't been studied. Um, from Women's Voices for the Earth standpoint, we're concerned that these chemicals are there. Um, we are exposed to these chemicals from lots of other sources. We simply should expect period products to be safe and to not include these toxic chemicals. Um, unfortunately, right now, it's very hard to avoid. It's hard to know which brands contain which ones and which don't um, because we don't have um, that uh, enough of that information. Um, but we are certainly working on it and trying to encourage um, companies to uh, to be more 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 careful with how they're making their products to avoid some of this um, harmful contamination. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so here are some ingredients to it that you can avoid because they are in fact found on package labels most of the time. These are the kinds of things you'll see um, disclosed, and we'll talk about you know what what we're finding and why these things um, could be harmful to your health. And again, we are just you know lacking the research to know which products are, are actually harming people and which aren't and to what degree. Um, it just hasn't been studied enough, unfortunately. Um, one of the things you'll find in a lot of different, uh, particularly disposable products, although also in some reusables, are plastics. Um, they're usually listed as ingredients like polyester, polypropylene, or polyethylene. The problem with plastics is they can release these microplastic particles. Um, there's one study on tampons showing like a single tampon can release something like a billion microplastic particles. It's really, really problematic. It's terrible for our ocean. It's bad for our fish. We don't know what they're doing to our health. Um, certainly they're, they're getting into our bodies as well and we don't know what they're, what they're doing. Um, fragrance is another category of chemicals. Fragrance isn't just one chemical. It can be a mixture of up to a hundred chemicals. Um, it can contain numerous chemicals linked to skin allergies. You do not want an allergy, you know, a skin reaction in this area of your body. Um, reproductive harm, cancer, there's a lot of chemicals in there. We strongly encourage people to choose unscented products. Um, we are happy to, to see more recently that um, scented tampons are kind of on the out. Uh, we're not seeing those in stores quite uh, nearly as much as we used to. There are still a lot of fragrance pads out there, but that is something you can avoid by looking for unscented products. Um, titanium dioxide. This is an interesting one. Titanium dioxide is a whitening agent. Um, in other forms of exposure, titanium uh, dioxide has been shown to cause cancer. We have no idea if titanium <laughs> dioxide in a, you know, a pad or a, or a, a tampon um, will give you cancer because no one has researched it. Um, the thing is, it's just there to make the product more white, which is really making it white for like the 15 seconds between you taking it out of the package and you using the product where it's not gonna stay white for very long. So there's not a lot of point in having the whitener there. There are certainly lots of products that don't bother adding this whitener. It doesn't seem to be worth the risk, especially since other exposures have linked it to cancer. Um, another cancer causing one are these polyethylene glycols. You usually see them on labels written as PEG, like PEG 10 or 11 or 15. Um, polyethylene glycols are in lots of different cosmetics. We're exposed to them a lot, um, but they can contain these cancer causing contaminants like ethylene dioxide and 1,4 dioxide. Again, not necessarily worth the risk. There are plenty of products that don't have these additives, these PEGs, um, so they can, um, they can be avoided um, by, by finding them on the label. Um, and then the last is this idea of this antibacterial layer. Um, it's usually nano silver or silver ions. Um, and this one um, is generally found in um, period underwear is where you find it. It's not always disclosed. Sometimes you have to ask the company if they use it. Um, the thing, the reason that silver gets added to period underwear um, is that it's, um, it's designed to make it antibacterial or anti-odor. Um, the thing is silver is actually totally toxic to vaginal tissue. Um, it's also totally toxic to healthy vaginal bacteria like lactobacillus. So you really don't want silver near your vaginal area. Um, but so why are we adding it, taking that risk to add it to period underwear? It comes back to this myth of period odor, right? Um, companies are telling you that 
you need it because you're going to smell bad on your period. And then you worry about that you're going to smell bad. Turns out you don't smell bad, you smell just fine, right? Um, it's no different from wearing underwear any other day. Um, adding silver has never been proven to make any difference, you know, to, to smell or to odor. Um, it's really just a marketing gimmick that's kind of preying on your this irrational fear of period odor. So you're fine and you smell beautiful. We don't need toxic silver in these products. So something to something to avoid. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide and we'll look at some labels. All right, so here are some examples of menstrual pads, just to show you kind of what they, the ingredients look like, um, where you find them. It looks just kind of like, you know, a bottle of shampoo or a, a, a package of food. You'll see a thing saying ingredients and it'll, it'll list them. Um, the one on the left, this is a, um, a set of uh, pads. You can see it's got a fairly long ingredient list. I sort of highlighted a few of the, the problematic ones. Um, polyethylene and polypropylene. These are some of the plastics um, I was talking about. There are um, four different polyethylene glycols, the PEGs um, listed in this uh, product. Um, there's something called pigment white six, which is another name for titanium dioxide. So it's got the sort of unnecessary whitener. And then it's got pigment blue 15. Um, again, these excess dyes, we don't really need blue flowers on our, on our pads. Um, it's just unnecessary exposure again to, to, an, to another chemical that we don't need. Um, on the right, on the other hand, here's another product. The ingredients very simply listed here are organic cotton and plant cellulose. So much shorter list of ingredients, a much simpler product, um, a lot less uh, chemical exposure to worry about. Um, let's go to the next slide. Okay, here's some examples with tampons. In, in this case, I chose two different um, uh, organic cotton tampons. There are, of course, lots of tampons that are also not um, organic that they contain rayon. Um, but I wanted to give uh, this interesting example that shows how sometimes um, packaging can be uh, a little deceiving. So on the left, you'll see a brand that says 100% organic cotton core tampons, which you would think would mean the ingredients would be 100% cotton, right? If you look at the, in the ingredients, it's actually cotton, but also the plastics, polypropylene and polyester, and then also that whitener titanium dioxide. So not what you'd expect for something that says it's 100% cotton. Um, I think the, the clue is that it's 100% cotton core. Um, so the sort of internal most absorbent part is actually 100% cotton, but there's other parts of it, the string, there could be a cover on it. Obviously they've added this whitener. Um, so there's more to it. So again, important to read the ingredients because um, sometimes these, these labels can be a little deceiving. Um, on the right is another example of organic uh, cotton tampons. It very clearly tells you the organic cotton is the absorbent material, the cover, the withdrawal string, the sewing thread, it's all made of organic cotton. Um, it does say that there's this paraffin emulsion, which is a withdrawal string moisture, moisture repellent. So it lets you know there's paraffin wax on the string to make sure that it does not basically degrade or you know when it gets wet. Um, so that's also helpful information, letting you know why that why those uh, that chemical is there. All right, next slide. Okay, here are two examples of. Um, uh, oh, I guess my oh, looks like my slide went off. Okay, um, period underwear and menstrual cups. Um, for period underwear, um, what we're we uh, this is the category of period products that um, actually has probably the, the worst ingredient disclosure. We're not seeing a lot of um, uh, ingredients being disclosed. This is probably one of the better um, better brands. So you can see there's elastane and cotton. There's also the polyester and polyurethane and polyamide, um, which are all plastics, um, which helps you know making it leak proof. Um, there is a colorant in there, although it doesn't tell you which one it is. Um, and then there's this thing called Aegean. That's the, the last one. Um, it doesn't tell you what that is, but I have to know that Aegean is silver. That is the antibacterial that they're using. Um, AG is the, the chemical symbol for silver. So that's always a clue. If you see a chemical in there with an AG in it, um, then that's probably silver. Also, really good idea to contact Company Superior Underwear to find out if they're using silver or not. Um, on the right is an example of ingredients for a menstrual cup. Pretty much across the board, you see um, ingredients for menstrual cups are things like 100% medical grade silicone, because that's they really are pretty simple. That's generally what they're made of. Um, some of them are colored, so there's a dye in there, which they don't always disclose. Um, this brand particularly mentions that they have no dyes, and then they also mention that they've got no latex in there. Um, I have seen um, a cup that is made of latex, 
that's particularly a problem if you've got a latex allergy um, and that and you need to know that, but generally you'll just see um, medical grade silicone. Okay. Um, yes, so that, I'm, I'm gonna wrap up because I've been talking a lot, but now we wanna ask you some questions. We'll leave it to Trani. Awesome, that was some great information, Alex. Thank you so much. So yeah, we are going to ask you some questions now. So get ready, uh, get your question cap on. Uh, where do you find information about the products you use and if they are safe or harmful? And use your chat feature for this, please. Um, where do you find the information about the products you use and if they are safe or harmful? I can tell y'all this, that I came into this position asking a lot of questions about the period products I have been using for sure. So what that tells me is making this information accessible is super important. Oh, that's nice to see that we're, <laughs> that we're a resource for this. It, it can be tricky. It can be tricky for sure. So now, one of the things that, that we learned when we started our um, period products campaigns was that a lot of people never thought about whether or not their products were safe or harmful. Um, it was it was a question they just use these products without without actually thinking about it. So, yeah. I'm oh, interesting finding things on TikTok. Yeah, there was there have been some some interesting things going around TikTok for sure. TikTok has been a useful tool I find for various things. Yep. Let's oh, there's see. a couple. It looks like a couple. Uh, Notes to Environmental Working Group. They do a lot of, uh, they've got a great website, particularly for um, uh, cosmetics as well as, as cleaning products that can give you information. This is great. Absolutely great, uh, great information. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it was, yeah, Environmental Working Group. Okay, great. Like well, this. good. I'm glad. I hope people continue to, to, to look to Women's Voices for the Earth for this information. I, I, know. Like this one, I, I just assume organic meant good. I didn't know what to look for on labels until now. Mm -hmm. I also assume the same thing, that organic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, thank you for the African perspective. You're saying that... And, Unfortunately, in Africa, there's no information available or even awareness regarding this issue. Yeah. Awesome. Can we go to the next question? Alrighty, thank y'all. Keep answering that if you have not already. Um, question two, how do you choose the period products you use? Do you tend to purchase brands that are more popular or have more exposure. So how do you choose your the period products you use? And do you choose them based on them being popular or more exposure? I can definitely say yes to that. The more I see on the TV or on TikTok, I just assume that those are better products. So. Mm -hmm. I love um, this answer saying, always brand sent me a free sample when I was a teen and I just settled in with them. That's, I've got two teenage daughters. They both came home from school with information, you know, from, from always in Tampax on, on menstruation when they had their, their uh, health ed. So yeah, that's definitely, that's definitely a big one. Yep. I like I made the switch to period cup four years ago and never looked back. I, I'm I'm wanting to join that club, but I have yet to do so. It's scary. So I, I we actually in, in some of our week conversations we talk about um, doing a class about period cups, what that looks like, stuff mm -hmm. like that. Scary for sure. <laughs> That's right. Again, yeah, great responses. Yep. Oh, yay. We at The Flow are here to provide free cup education and free cups. We can support your journey. That's oh, terrific. Put your 
information in Thanks, the Delphine. That's great. <laughs> Okay, more, more education on period cups. It's fantastic. It's exactly why we hold these things. This is great. This is great. Oh, yeah. I use what my mom and sister used. That's a, that's very common. Very common. You get given something when you, when, you know, when you first start your period, and it's whatever who's teaching you about it is going to give you. Yeah. It takes some education. Yeah. All right, we got to a vote for a class on period cups. All right, we'll, we'll have to work on that. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Great job. Move on. This is uh, super duper important right here. There is no perfect product. There is no perfect product. Um, it is super important for us that we to acknowledge that there is no perfect product out there. Uh, and even though we tried to find those, uh, unfortunately, there is going to be no perfect product. Uh, yeah. Next. Uh, let's talk about stigma. Ooh, we're getting into it now. I think for me, uh, Stigma is one of the things that, um, for me at least, I, I faced a lot um, growing up, um, especially when it came to, uh, you know, our communities and then having, uh, being Native American and the culture around it. Uh, and so how do we talk about menstruation? Um, so let's, let's talk about the period stigma. Uh, which is so pervasive in our society and unfortunately so harmful. Think about how we talk about menstruation. For one, we usually don't talk about it. How many of y'all can say you don't talk about it? How many of you can say that it, it was never talked uh, with you uh, about when you were younger? Um, so that's super important. Uh, it is something many of us are told uh, that it is to be dealt with privately. We go to all kinds of effort to hide menstruation. There's often shame and embarrassment associated with other people knowing you, you are on your period. Now, who can, who can say they, they've uh, had tampons or pads and hid them in their pocket or put them in their purse and went to the bathroom without trying to be noticed, you know, that they actually had these products um, I, I can say that that's me and it's been me for a very long time. Um, so, uh, so there's embarrassment associated with this. There are all kinds of cultural taboos around menstruation when in reality, menstruation is perfectly healthy, natural process, and it is experienced by about half of the world's population. So menstruation is crucial to fertility and the survival of our species. Uh, yet we have given a lot of uh, sorry. Yet we have given it a lot of negative baggage, um, and this has had many unfortunate re uh, results, such as delays on making safer, more comfortable, more convenient period products, um, and also um, period uh, product innovation was not a priority for many corporations, uh, especially um, when decisions were often being made by non-menstruators. Hmm. And some of that comes down to not wanting to talk about periods during board meetings. Uh, the same issues has hampered legislation uh, for making period products safer. So I'm guessing that the non-menstruators are like super comfortable about this topic. That's just my guess. Uh, not many, uh, not that many years ago, there were members of Congress who wouldn't even consider having a hearing for a bill that had to do with menstruation, claiming it was inappropriate to discuss the topic. Wow. Hmm. And that's a, an interesting, super interesting. So how do we talk about menstruation? How do you talk about menstruation to family, friends, 
colleagues. I know at we we talk about menstruation pretty often, which is an amazing thing to do. That's how we uh, uh, break stigma. And for me, it's, it's gotten easier to talk about it. Uh, and how has that affected uh, our experience and your experience? So next, please. I'm alive. I'm live. Arts? Sorry. Do you have anything? Uh, OK. All righty. Let's open this up for questions now. Who has any questions? I know I have a ton, but this is not here for me. <laughs> uh, please use your question and answer button uh, so that we can see them and we can uh, answer any questions that you may have. And we'll answer as many as we can within the time allotted. Um, so please use your question and answer function. Ask Alex and I questions. I mean, who literally has Alex Scranton available to answer questions <laughs> right now today? Alex is brilliant and amazing. Let's see here. I was gonna say there was one question that was in the chat at the very beginning, I think sort of up front. Um, that was asking about risk factors associated with using menstruation products, which is a, a, a great question and a really interesting one. Um, uh, I think I mentioned before, there's just not a lot of um, research that's done on what is happening to people using period products and what kind of reactions are the, you know, are the, are they having? What are those implications of those reactions? Um, we're really concerned about a lot of the things that we've read sort of anecdotally. You hear about people, you know, like, oh yeah, I get a, I get a UTI every time I have my period, you know? And you're like, well, is, is that to do with your period or is it to do with the product you're using? You know, I mean, it's really hard to separate these things out. I mean, there are, you know, people getting more, uh, more migraines and things on, on periods. Again, could totally be due to kind of the fluctuation of hormones, um, but it also might have something to do with, you know, reactions to, to the exposures that you're getting. Um, a lot of times you'll have symptoms for a couple of days, you're used to being miserable for a couple of days, and then it goes away. But of course your exposure to products also goes away um, when your symptoms go away. So um, it's, it's a great question that we unfortunately don't have the answers to, but we strongly encourage people to think about the symptoms that they may be having. Even if they seem small, um, symptoms can lead to, to, to bigger chronic problems. So um, if you are having symptoms during your, during your period, try a different product. There are lots of different alternatives. You don't have to, you know, like, like trying to say, like you, you try a cup, you don't have to do the cup forever. You can, you can try different things. You can try something for a month. You can try different brands um, and see what your experience is and, and whether or not it's different. Cause there's again, plenty of anecdotal stories that people's experience and people's health effects change dramatically when they change, when they change products. So. Alex, we do have a question. Oh, yes. Guys in Diva Cups safe. Oh, dyes. You know, again, there isn't research looking at um, whether or not the dyes and things like um, menstrual cups um, are safe. It is certainly, a, you know, potentially another exposure if any of that dye chemical comes out of the cup. Um, I don't know if they sort of, you know, fade over time, which gives you some sense that, that the dye is coming out. Um, there are lots of undyed cups that are just sort of that general, uh, you know, sort of clearish um, silicone uh, 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 color. So, um, you know, we, we encourage again, the simpler products that you can find um, uh, just, just in case it depends. There are some dyes that are harmful, but we don't know which ones are getting used in cups. Thank you for that. Um, do you have any products you recommend or would feel comfortable using now? Oh, tricky question. Um, we don't, um, as an organization, sort of endorse products specifically. So we we strongly encourage people to, you know, to look for unscented, to look for the simpler products um, that you can use. And again, every, pro every everybody's different in terms of what they need. Um, we do have some business partners, um, which you can find on our website. These are companies that we believe are, you know, sort of working towards the right thing that support uh the roles of weave, so you can look to them um, as well. But otherwise, I can't really give you, you know, specific products. But I certainly encourage people to try 
different ones and to read read the ingredients and to contact companies um, if you're not sure about a product and ask them questions. They need to know that you're really interested in, in what's um, in the product. I think an important um, thing to stay on this is there. this is a lot of information. We've has done a ton of research around it. And a lot of that information is on our website. So if we don't get um, the information that you are seeking, I would strongly encourage you to go to our website um, and look up this information because there is a ton of research that uh, we have done with other organizations that is just amazing. So, um, alrighty, next question. Um, is propylene glycol glycol the same as the other glycol chemicals you mentioned? It is oh. from toothpaste and food to anaphase. Oh, interesting. Um, I was talking about polyethylene glycol, so it is a little bit different. Um, and the, the, um, uh, the cancer causing contaminants that are in polyethylene glycols, it comes from the, the ethyl, ethoxylated, it's kind of the process um, to make these chemicals, and that's where those contaminants come up. So it is different from, from propylene glycol, which can have other issues for sure. But it's, it is, it, they, these would be different chemicals, but probably somewhat related, but, but, but different. Yeah. You know what freaks me out seeing in some of those chemicals is formaldehyde. Seeing formaldehyde and some of that is scary. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and again, that's not one of the ones we've seen on the labels, but a lot of different um, studies have have found it have found it in there. So we're again not sure how it's getting created or how it's kind of ending up in these products, um, but it's yeah, it's a concern for sure. Okay, next question: uh, Can you run through why silver in period pants may be a negative ingredient? Sure, and I talked a little bit um, about this, but I can go into it more. We've got a great fact sheet on our website. Um, I don't know, maybe Liz, you can if we can find that link, we can put it in, put it in the chat, um, and actually some of the toolkit too. So there's um, uh, silver has a lot of issues. It, silver is you know great at killing bacteria in some um, circumstances where where it can be used. Um, but the silver that gets used in period products, often it's nano silver, which is this really, really tiny sort of particles of silver, which um, certainly environmentally is a problem. It's if you think about it, it's kind of like glitter. Like if you use glitter and you spill glitter, like you can clean it up, but there's always going to be a little bit of glitter somewhere. It just gets everywhere and it's really hot, you know. So nano silver is the same thing. It kind of gets out there and it's just all over the earth and then it's killing bacteria when we don't want it to kill bacteria, right? Um, particularly silver is toxic both to vaginal tissue. It can just, you know, just sort of rip up the vaginal lining um, and it can kill important lactobacillus. So um, number of reasons that silver is just, you know, first of all, it's totally unnecessary. You don't need it. Um, and uh, it's got these toxic properties which make it, you know, a real red flag. Awesome. Uh, have you done any work on ingredients in inconstant products? Have been more absorbing. Oh, this is this is a really good question. Thank you for asking it. Um, uh, the issue is incontinence products. So these are products to absorb urine as opposed to um, uh, as opposed to menstrual fluid. Um, they are very similar products, um, often made by the same companies because there's you know a lot of the same sort of technology. There are a couple possible couple chemical differences. Um, the law in New York unfortunately did not include incontinence products, so we don't still don't have perfect ingredients um, for incontinence products. We have strongly encouraged those companies that make both to both you know they'll. They'll make both products and they'll have ingredients on one package, but not on the other, um, which which seems crazy because they're used in very similar ways, have very similar um, exposures, except with incontinence products, often they're, you know, worn 24-7 all the time as opposed to a couple days a month. Um, so there's even more exposure. Um, there's a lot less um, chemical testing that's been done on those, but we certainly encourage that to happen. Um, and we're hoping to get more information um, either from companies voluntarily disclosing their ingredients or finally getting getting it passed in a law um, so we can get ingredients on the package um, and see whether or not there are any any uh, differences there. But certainly, uh, you know, definitely a concern because there's a there can be a lot of exposure for people who are using them all the time. 
um, there's tremendous exposure to, to what those products are made of. But we need more research. But really good point. Thanks for bringing it up. Yeah, that is a great point. Um, next question. If using period underwear with using a pad to catch heavy flows and not just using the underwear bone next to skin, is that better? Interesting. Got it. So the, yeah, so using it with the pad sort of for the extra um, um, extra absorbency. Um, I don't know that it's um, necessarily um, better or worse. I mean, obviously, there'd be more exposure to the pad, because um, that's a, adjacent to your skin as opposed to um, as opposed to the um, the underwear. So it, you know, it'd be exposure either way. Um, so it, so, um, but I suppose it would probably a little bit less exposure to the silver if there is silver in there. Um, there are still issues with the silver getting into the environment, kind of the glitter problem. Um, we've had uh, companies talk about the silver being non-migratory and it stays embedded in the fabric and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't leave, um, to which I've often told them just take a look at the lint filter in your washing machine, you know, or in your dryer, um, you know, the, the fabric itself is not migratory, the, you know, the stuff is coming out of the fabric and, um, and getting into our environment. So there, it's still a sort of a problematic environmentally, there certainly would be less exposure um, uh, if you had the, the pad um, in there, so, yeah. Awesome, next question. Uh, are there national level policy actions happening to address toxins in menstrual products? Also, does the EPA acknowledge this as an issue? Oh, interesting. Um, let's see, there are um, uh, a few um, bills that have come across as far as looking at toxicity in um, menstrual products that um, that has not come up as, as a federal um, bill specifically. We'll talk a little bit in, in, in the second, we've got a slide later on about the Robin Danielson Act, um, which is an act that would require research, the kind of research I've been talking about that we really need. Um, but there hasn't been a federal bill on, um, on, on that. There have been some bills in the past which um, haven't gone anywhere yet on um, uh, requiring ingredient disclosure nationally. Um, uh, so there's, there's been some bills on that. Um, does EPA know this is an issue? I guess this might be, well, is it an EPA issue or an FDA issue? I think it's an FDA issue. Technically, um, uh, menstrual products like period, um, pads and tampons are actually medical devices officially, which is kind of a weird category for them to be in, but that's how they're regulated in the U S. Um, so the FDA is, um, aware of some of these issues, but they have fairly um, lax regulations currently on what, what is allowed in, in these products and what isn't. Um, but yes, we would like to bring it more to their attention for sure. Great, Alex. We have time for one more question. Uh, a lot of concern about products that are marketed to help with odor and cleanliness like scents and douches. They are not menstrual products, but can they be regulated? Oh, this is a great question. It's a, it's a great intro to our next 101 in the series. We'll be talking about intimate care products, things like douches, wipes, sprays. Um, there is tremendous marketing associated with these products. Um, and there is a lot of concern about the chemicals that are in there. Um, technically, most of them are gonna be considered, again, not medical devices, but regulated as cosmetics. Um, so they will be required to have um, ingredients on the label. So that's helpful. Um, uh, and we'll get more into that in, in, in our next session. But there's also we've got a, quite a bit of information on our website as well um, about these products. But yes, definitely a concern because of the types of it's it's a very unique exposure when you're talking about intimate care products or period products because it's this vaginal and vulvar exposure. Um, and most of the sort of other products, cosmetics that we use, it's just um, being, you know, uh, exposed to other parts of your skin, but your vaginal and vulvar area is just different. It's very, it's, it's very unique. It's very absorptive. It's very sensitive. There's lots of blood flow. I mean, there's all kinds of issues. There's mucous membranes. It's really just a different part of your body altogether. And so the exposure is really unique and the chemical implications are really unique um, and different. So a lot of concerns there, but thank you for that, that setup for our next, our next 101.
Got you, Alex. Okay. Um, where are we? This is where we are. Okay. So um, we've got these recommendations for users of period products, and we've talked a lot about these. Um, and this will be available to you as well after the um, after the webinar. Um, finding safer products, reading product ingredients is really important, um, as we gave a few examples of that. Taking a look and seeing how simple or complicated these products are. Um, you can look for products that don't contain plastics, things like polyester or polypropylene or polyethylene. Um, that's one way to avoid some of these um, exposures. Um, you can look for products that contain 100% cotton that don't have these plastic layers. Um, sometimes there's more of a cost, particularly if it's organic cotton, so that can be um, that can be the issue. But that's one thing to look for. Um, looking for products that have simpler and fewer ingredients, avoiding fragrance, avoiding colorants and dyes that are unnecessary, um, avoiding products with those PEGs, so polyethylene glycols. Um, and then, like I was saying before, paying attention to any symptoms that occur during the use of a product um, and trying, you know, trying a different brand, trying a different kind of product, seeing if it makes a difference um, to your health. You're, you're the one who really will, will know that. Um, and can tell what's what's working for your body and what isn't. And the next slide, okay. The second part of find, getting safer products is using your voice to demand health, safer and healthier products. And this is absolutely what makes a difference. It's what has gotten us this far um, in our campaigns. It's not something again that we can do alone. Really encourage you call the 1-800 number on the product, send an email to the email on the product asking them about their ingredients, asking them why they're using these ingredients, letting them know that you care about the ingredients in the, in the product, particularly if their ingredients you're unfamiliar with and you're like, why is that in there? You can ask these questions and they need to be able to, um, to know. If you're not getting a good answer and they're not answering you, that tells you a lot too about the company um, and how much you can, you can trust them. If you decide to switch brands, right? And, you're, and you realize that one product is much better for your health than another, Tell the company that you switched from about this. You tell both companies, right? Tell them why you no longer use the product and tell them why you do use the product. This is feedback they absolutely need to know. Um, otherwise, they think that all of their customers are just, you know, happy and, and going forward. Um, and then lastly, it's, you know, breaking down that stigma. Talk to your friends and family about your concerns with chemicals and period products. Have conversations about menstruation. Encourage your friends in, um, to, to view this webinar, to view our materials, to um, look at labels and ask those questions too. The more we're talking about this, the more you are um, making it an issue that these ingredients are important. Because for just for so long, we didn't know it was in there. No one knew to ask any questions, right? And companies just went along adding all kinds of things to these products that we didn't know about. So. Um, we really need to um, have everyone sort of, you know, chip in and do, and do their part to use your voice because it, it's really what will make safer products in the end. Oh, and this is the action alert I was telling you about later. This is an active bill in Congress right now called the Robin Danielson Act, and it would require the National Institutes of Health to conduct research on the health risks of ingredients in period and both intimate care products. So things we've talked about like phthalates and pesticides and titanium dioxide is the kind of research that would be required by this bill. So we've got a, a great um, link there. It's very easy on our website. It'll send it, uh, an email automatically to your congressional representatives telling them to support this bill. Do you want to talk about the toolkit, Trini? Um, yes, Alex. So we created this amazing toolkit for y'all to use. We know and understand that this is a lot of information to take in and to absorb in an hour. And so we created this toolkit for y'all to use, to save, to print, to share with everybody or you know whoever you wanna share this with. It has a lot of information that uh, we went over today. It has information that we weren't able to um, present today. It has links to our website and some uh, information that um, goes, that you can take a deep dive into some of these, um, these areas that we discussed today. Uh, we really created it for y'all to use, to, to be able to have access to this information 
an all-in-one document. This is not at all all the information that we have um, gathered. It's just, I think it's like 10 pages, which is still a lot and a ton <laughs> when, when we're looking at toolkits. Um, but we really wanted to be able to uh, have something for y'all to take home and to print and to just have to to, to look back on and um, if y'all have any questions to be able to, to skim through it. So um, thank y'all. Uh, I think Liz, Liz uh, Elizabeth linked that in our chat. So please take a look at that. Um, and with that, we are at the end of our webinar. Again, thank you so much for joining us, the way out so for joining us today. Um, remember to follow us on our website and our website has a ton of information um, and our Facebook and our Instagram. And please let us know, scan the QR code and let us know how the webinar went today. Um, this helps us help y'all um, about making things better, more accessible, uh, what we, what y'all want to hear about. Um, and don't forget that we have our Intimate Care Products 101 series coming up in April. Please sign up for that. I appreciate y'all. Uh, have a beautiful Wednesday. Enjoy this beautiful day. Don't forget, please um, fill out the evaluation form. I think you're good. I think you're done. I know that's a lot of information. So appreciate y'all. Thank you so much. So just great conversation and great, uh, great questions. And yeah, really appreciate the, the attendance and, and interest in the issue. It's great. All right, y'all. Have a Thanks. great day.